Now in lesson two, I'll be challenging your beliefs on health risk and vulnerability. We discussed lifespan in lesson one, and now it's time to focus on what makes you feel the way that you do about health. Do you believe that you're invincible? Or are you aware of the risk associated with the lack of exercise and a poor diet? Perceived vulnerability is also known as perceived susceptibility, perceived likelihood, and perceived probability. I would describe it as the way that we interpret the threats to our health. Perceived severity is also known as perceived seriousness. I describe it as the way that we interpret the consequences of a health event or outcome. So what is the likelihood of developing a health problem? What is more of a threat, a common cold or a heart attack? We would all say a heart attack. Why? Because heart attacks can be fatal. Every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a heart attack. But because of age-related factors, such as the amount of time it could take for the damage to the heart muscle to get to a point of a heart attack, we're more likely to catch a cold. Data from the Center of Disease Control shows that adults have an average of two to three colds per year, while children suffer from about six to 10 colds a year. And because most people recover from the common cold in about seven to 10 days, that's 14 to 30 days per year that the average American adult suffers from the common cold. We don't often consider colds to be life-threatening, but those with weakened immune systems or respiratory conditions, it could lead to serious illnesses such as bronchitis or pneumonia. Because the common cold is so common, we're much more aware of how to protect ourselves. Food for thought. Foods that are rich in vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants are vital when it comes to strengthening our immune system. This includes foods such as dried tart cherries, turmeric, chamomile, walnuts, oily fish, citrus fruits, leafy greens, blueberries, and more. All right, so what about the heart disease? Let's analyze. Nearly 1 billion colds are reported every year, while approximately 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes occur every year in the U.S., more than 800,000 people in the United States die from cardiovascular disease every year. Yeah, that's about one in every three deaths. And of those 800,000, about 160,000 of them occur in people under the age of 65. Heart disease kills almost the same number of people each year as cancer, lower respiratory diseases, including pneumonia, and accidents combined. Now that brings me to the next topic, perceived severity. All right, so just for a moment, I want to circle back and look at heart disease. It's the number one cause of death in the United States, and it's totally preventable. But because we associate heart attacks and strokes with old age, we don't give it much consideration when we're young. Unfortunately, this is where most of the damage is done in our younger years. See, children don't have much of a say-so when it comes to their diet. They're normally at the mercy of whatever the parent provides. It's safe to say that parents have the most influence over their children's health. The more informed parents are, the more likely they are to guide their children toward healthier lifestyles. This includes food and exercise. But what if the parents aren't informed? Well, when a person isn't informed, they're not aware of the potential risks associated with the poor diet and lack of exercise. They don't really understand the potential health complications that could occur as a result of having a sedentary lifestyle or eating lots of fried foods. In fact, the more sedentary a person is, the more likely they are to be unaware of the effects of a poor diet. So who do you talk to the most? Because most of our perceptions are shared. So when our family members, friends, significant other, or colleagues become aware of something important, most often we become aware as well. Let me use a call center environment as an example. Call center jobs require lots of time on the phone and lots of time sitting at a desk. That can lead to poor or worsen eating habits, irritability, anxiety, and stress. And because call centers are known to be very densely populated, there's a high probability we could find people who have similar lifestyle characteristics. They may also share similar ideas and have similar values. Here's something to think about. 
If dozens of people can be found enjoying cigarettes or vaping in designated smoking areas at work, then the perception of severity can be diminished. The thought that everyone else is doing it, it can't be too bad, may enter the minds of those considering quitting. Others may feel that smoking helps them relieve stress and may dismiss the fact that there are any harmful effects at all. But how well does smoking relieve stress? It depends on who you ask, right? Is it really the actual nicotine doing the job or is it the relief of the withdrawal-induced negative mood that smokers get between cigarettes? The CDC reports that over 480,000 deaths occur annually from cigarette smoke, including deaths from secondhand smoke. The overall mortality rate for male and female smokers in the U.S. is about three times higher than those who've never smoked. Now, I listed lifespan earlier as a perceived benefit of creating a sustainable, healthy lifestyle. Well, here we're examining smoking, and the life expectancy for smokers is at least 10 years shorter than for non-smokers. Now, that's a lot to consider. 10 years is a long time. A lot can happen in 10 years. Kids can get married and have kids of their own. Grandkids can go from first grade to learning how to drive in 10 years. See, we have to look at the big picture. Smoking causes more deaths per year than HIV, illegal drug use, alcohol use, motor vehicle, and firearm-related incidents combined. Now, did you know that quitting smoking before the age of 40 reduces the risk of dying from smoking-related disease by 90%? But it's not just a smoker who's affected, remember? Secondhand smoke kills too. In fact, secondhand smoke causes about 41,000 deaths per year among adults in the United States. The CDC reports that over 480,000 deaths occur annually from cigarette smoke. Here's some food for thought. Smoking harms the neuroreceptors in the mouth, dulling tasting ability. But when smokers stop smoking, within two weeks they can regain that tasting ability. Quitting smoking can spark urges to snack. Your internal clock is reset. That 9 a.m. cigarette is no more. Where you once took a break at a designated smoking area, now you're heading to a common area with vending machines. Well, this is where the willpower kicks in. Not only are you combating the nicotine craving, now you have to fight the urge to snack. So what I would suggest is bagging air popcorn and taking it with you. Work, gym, grocery store, etc. And if you get the urge to try something sweet, snack on some frozen grapes. So for perceived threats, let's use cancer as an example. Do you believe that cancer is A, severe, B, serious, or C, significant. Typically, the higher we perceive the threat of a particular health condition, the more likely we are to engage in health-promoting behaviors. I'm part of the group that likes to avoid illness. I understand the threats that are out there and how they would affect my life physically, socially, psychologically, and financially. If you're already suffering from a medical condition, then you're aware of the benefits of a lifestyle change. It's about getting well and staying well. The actions we perceive as preventative and beneficial is why you're here. This is a step in the right direction. This is a positive action. Here's some food for thought. In the United States, we love cookouts. There's nothing better than a good old get together with some fresh hamburgers and hot dogs off the grill. Well, what about those hot dogs that we love so much? Well, it's said that sodium nitrite and sodium nitrate have both been linked to significantly increase the risk of cancer. So the next time you think about hosting a cookout, make sure you buy some uncured meat products that are free of nitrites and nitrates. Now we know that being healthy is important. We know that we should stay away from foods that could increase our risk of cancer. But what is it that gets in the way of us being able to make these changes? What types of barriers exist? Financial barriers? Psychological barriers? What about social barriers?
I'll use myself as an example. This is me here at age 10. I used to love soda. And as a child, my grandmother always had a two liter soda in the fridge and one on standby for when that one would run out. My favorite was Big Red. I didn't always get it because it wasn't always on sale. See, my grandma was all about the Sunday coupon clippings. Sometimes I'd be right there with it, planning our attack. Now, as I got older, I moved on to Sprite, then Dr. Pepper. I drink a couple of cans along with a pizza as part of a hangover remedy. But in the past five years, I may have had only 10 sodas. That's two per year. I know what's at risk, so I cut them out of my diet. They're loaded with sugar, high fructose corn syrup to be exact, food chemicals and artificial food colorings. See, soda acidifies the body, literally feeding cancer cells. In my coaching practice, I often use myself as an example to show how weaning myself off of bread changed my life. See, when I go to a restaurant to serve fresh rolls or breadsticks, I couldn't just have one or two. I'd eat the whole basket. There was something about being full and getting my money's worth that drove me to indulge. See, it took me a while for me to put it all together. I cut out the soda and the bread at the same time because my cravings were paired. I go out to eat, order a soda, get free refills. Eat a basket of bread. They keep filling it back up. You do that often enough over the years and it adds up. I looked up and I was almost 300 pounds. 60 pounds higher than I was in my prime at the age of 27. Now, it didn't take me long to start seeing the weight drop. My exercise habits improved because I felt much better. My energy improved. Next on my list was alcohol. Now, I only drink on special occasions, which at most is about once or twice per quarter. The better I felt after cutting bread, the more I wanted to know why. The better I felt after cutting soda, the more I wanted to know why. Cutting down on alcohol, same effect. I can tell you that I'm glad I did it. Know this, the regular consumption of refined carbohydrates was linked to 220% increase in breast cancer among women. It's high glycemic foods such as white bread, white rice, french fries, and donuts that cause spikes in blood sugar, which directly is linked to the growth and spreading of cancer cells. See, the barrier that I held was knowledge. See, I didn't previously care to challenge my beliefs. Therefore, I didn't bother to educate myself. I was good. Until I could no longer accept how I felt and how I looked. So what about financial barriers? Because I hear tons of people weighing in on the difficulties they have making lifestyle changes. One of the most popularly held cultural biases of recent past is that the rich can afford to eat healthier while the poor cannot. This is known as nutritional inequality. Now see, this stemmed from the disparity in household income to the suggested accessibility of healthy food options. So what you hear on the street is, how can I afford to make this change and eat better on this budget? I have too many mouths to feed. Or you might hear, how am I supposed to eat healthy in the nearest grocery store with what I need is on the other side of town? Well, we could argue that all healthy food options aren't expensive and accessibility to healthy food options isn't as restricted as we'd like to believe. See, our perception is learned. We see most of what we've learned to believe and accept. If we learn a hardship, we see a hardship. Yes, the struggle indeed may be real, but whether or not you allow it to stifle your growth or use it as motivation to change your life is up to you. See, most of the reason lower income households spend their money on less healthy food isn't because of access, it's because of ignorance. Information is everything. This is more of a reason to understand the impact of patterns. Because if you eat a certain way for years, you begin to accept your choices. They're normalized. Frankly, if you knew better, then you would do better. And most of us don't intentionally place ourselves in harm's way. So let's turn to research for a second. Now, a recent study compared the causes of nutritional inequality 
claims that a large percentage of low-income households are in what's known as food deserts and don't have the same access to full-service supermarkets. Now, it seems as though if researchers were looking for data to reject the idea that neighborhood environments have meaningful contributions to nutritional inequality, then they found it. The data showed that. When they compared the products and prices available to both high and low income households, there's only a 9% reduction in nutritional inequality. While 91% of the suggested difference was driven by differences in demand. In a nutshell, it's not the availability of nutritious food. It's the demand that we should be worried about. And because demand is the focus, that means nutritional education and food preferences are to blame. Now, this class isn't about political views, so don't get distracted. This should shed light on the problems we face as a society. The topic should be, how do we educate low-income families on how to create sustainable, healthy lives? How do we level the playing field? Remember, it's not always about money. In fact, Portion size is one of the biggest obstacles that we face. You can gain weight by eating too much of anything, vegetables and fruits included. Now in phase two, you'll learn how to combat these ideas and learn how you should be grocery shopping. Food for thought. Fresh produce is one of the more expensive purchases that we make at the grocery store. With fruits and vegetables packing such a huge punch of nutrition, we need them. We can do fresh, frozen, or canned. Now the study, Nutrition and Cost Comparisons of Select Canned, Frozen, and Fresh Fruits and Vegetables, analyzed over 40 scientific journal studies and nutrition data. It compared the fresh, frozen, and canned fruits and vegetables based on nutrition and cost by nutrients per calorie for each packaging type. Lead researcher Stephen Miller stated this, Canned fruits and vegetables provide high quality nutrition to Americans regardless of income level and geography. By increasing accessibility to key nutrients many Americans need, canned foods are a year round solution to help families prepare healthier balanced meals. Another perceived barrier many of us have trouble with is time. Now that's in the arena of both diet and exercise. Now, even though I won't spend a lot of time on solutions until phase two, you should understand the importance of progress. Many of us look directly at where we are instead of where we've been when it comes to getting healthy. So you have to find something good that you can lean on. For many, what's good is picturing where you once were, the way you looked before that last child, the way you felt before picking up that second shift. Say, I want you to think about a time where you looked and you felt your greatest. If you're thinking, I've never looked or felt great, then imagine how you'd like to look and how you'd like to feel. All right, so now you should have a visual. That's your after. This is how you take the steps to get back to where you want to be. You are capable. Remember, doubt does not dwell within you. Fear does not dwell within you. Inadequacy does not dwell within you crush the ants and if you don't know what ants are they're automatic negative thoughts so how about skill because how many of you doubt your ability to make this transformation how many of you doubt your ability to make the necessary changes to your life that will allow you to thrive hold no reservations because in phase two you're going to learn skill i want you to be confident in all that you do learn to shop healthier cook healthier, be more mindful when you eat, exercise efficiently, and improve your mobility and more. You got this. I believe in you. Now let's talk about cues to action. This is the what that's gonna make you execute the plan ahead. You already have the why. Now bring that image of your former or future self back to the front of your mind. Let's take it a step further because I wanna stimulate your senses. 
What does it smell like when you're your healthiest? I want you to focus on a particular setting. I can tell you what it smells like for me. It's that mint and eucalyptus fragrance I get added to the room during my massages. Ah. Now, what does healthy taste like? Because for me, I taste the Mediterranean salad. I can taste the olives, the feta cheese right now, the texture of the olive oil. Mm. So what does healthy look like? For me, healthy looks like the 8% body fat I finally achieved in the summer of 2018. Man, that was a beast mode summer. And finally, what does healthy sound like? Because for me, it's the sound of weights clanging and banging. And my runner up is the sounds of nature in my runs. The crickets, the birds, the wind and footsteps. Gotta love it. Now make sure you keep those senses active. Take them with you everywhere that you go. When it's dark, let those bring you light. When negativity enters your space, use them to calm you. Because see, we're not perfect and we must accept that. We make mistakes and we have setbacks. There's a lot that goes on that's beyond our control. But what we can do is maximize the power that we have. Getting better, progressing. It takes patience, it takes trust, but you have to believe in yourself and believe in the mission. Believe me, it's worth your time. It's worth the sacrifice. And because it's worth it to you, and there's so much value in it for you, others should feel the same way. You should have the support that you need. And if you don't, don't let it discourage you. Don't be deterred. Because see, what we're trying to do is avoid the acute action in the form of a negative diagnosis. Even though we hear these stories all the time where someone wakes up in pain and suddenly goes to the emergency room and they hope of a simple solution, a simple diagnosis, but then they walk out with the terminal prognosis. However, we also hear about the miraculous recoveries from terminal prognosis. But why leave it to chance? when you can make the effort right now to reduce the risk of developing heart disease, diabetes, cancer, or any other life-altering disease. This is why you're here. This is your cue to action. It's a big step. Why? Because you decided that you weren't done. You decided that you wouldn't be defeated. And you're not going to quit until you reach the top, and I love it. Now that brings us to the last topic in this lesson, self-efficacy. And in case you're not familiar with this term, I've been emphasizing its importance for quite some time. Self-efficacy is the confidence you have in your ability to accomplish a task, reach a goal, or even solve problems. The basis of you even participating in this class shows that you have confidence in yourself. This has nothing to do with whether you respect yourself, love yourself, or how you perceive yourself. This is just whether or not you feel you can get the job done. Here, your self-awareness is challenged. For instance, psychology experts compare self-esteem to self-efficacy by noting that self-esteem is focused on a feeling of being, whereas self-efficacy is focused on doing. So you find that your self-efficacy and motivation go hand in hand. The more confident you are in your ability to do something, the more motivated you become. Because see, when you lack confidence in your ability, you lose that motivation. And we see this all the time. Now, how many of you have lost confidence midway through a task only to find yourself stuck, lost in the directions with no clear solution in sight? I have. I've had to stop, take a deep breath and reevaluate. But I persevered and so can you. You know, sometimes life has a way of placing obstacles in our path where none should be just to prepare us. Sometimes failure is just the perception of our learning ability. Some take a more hands-on approach, trial and error, while others observe and calculate from afar before finally deciding to move forward. Now this can be the difference in one's confidence in his or her ability to succeed. Think about all those who've come and gone, who've tried and failed. Did they just hang their head and say, I'm such a failure? 
never to make an attempt again? Or did they get back up, reevaluate, set their targets and try again? Of course they did. So who do you know with high self-efficacy? Is there anything that you can learn or have learned from them? How do they impact your life and how do they perceive obstacles? All right, so I've given a little assignment for you. Exercise 2.1 is to help improve your awareness as it relates to others and their focus on health. The first question asks simply, who do you look up to and admire the most? The second question is tricky as it asks, the qualities I like most about this person is, and understand that this course is health related and so is this exercise. Because if you like this person because of the way they make you feel, unfortunately, that's not what's being asked. I want you to think about what qualities pertaining to their health do you like? such as their dedication to a balanced diet. Maybe they meal prep. Maybe they're committed to fitness. The third question requires that you consider what you would need to do to be more like that person. And the final question wants you to write down what you know about their exercise and diet behaviors. Remember, in case you haven't downloaded the workbook, you can download the assignments by going to reviveyou.com forward slash assignments. Good luck and I'll see you in the next lesson.